this lesson is going to be an introduction to nuclear physics. Uh, we'll start by identifying a number of different nuclear particles that we're going to encounter somewhere throughout this chapter. We'll move on to talking about uh, atomic symbols and how those can be used to figure out the composition of a nucleus, and then also how that is related to the stability of that nucleus. And then finally, we'll top this lesson off talking about the nuclear binding energy, which is also going to have a relationship to nuclear stability. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So let's start off with a list of nuclear particles you're likely to encounter in this chapter. And uh, if you've got any background in chemistry, some of these or all of these might be familiar, but if you don't, much of this might be a little bit new, at least uh, with the specifics. Now we're going to start with the heaviest of the nuclear particles and work our way down to the lightest. And we'll see at the end that we've written them in this order for a reason. So we're going to start with the alpha particle. And the way it works for a nuclear symbol, it works the same way as it does for a chemical symbol. And we're going to come back to this chemical symbol in just a little bit here. So with a chemical symbol like this one for uranium, the top number here is going to be what we call the mass number. And it's equal to the number of protons plus neutrons in the nucleus for that particular element. So on the bottom number here is going to be called the atomic number and it's going to be equal to the number of protons in a nucleus. Now what's going to be a little bit different with nuclear particles is that if we have protons in that nuclear particle, so then that bottom number, that atomic number, if you will, will correspond to the number of protons. But if there are no protons, it will always correspond to the charge on that particle. Now the top number is still going to be the mass number and it still will be the sum of the protons plus the neutrons as we'll see. All right, so we'll start with this alpha particle again, and if you notice the mass number is four, that means it has four total protons and neutrons combined. The atomic number is two, and it does indeed have two protons. And so notice, if you take the difference between these two, if the mass number is the protons and neutrons combined, and the atomic number here is the number of protons, well then subtract four minus two to find the number of neutrons. And in this case, an alpha particle does indeed have two protons and two neutrons. One thing to note, is it's also sometimes also written as helium-4,2 because it turns out it is the same thing as a helium nucleus. Now notice I didn't say helium atom because it doesn't have any electrons around it. It's just the equivalent of the helium nucleus. And so whether you see it written with the alpha symbol or the helium symbol, so it means exactly the same thing. Now it turns out that protons and neutrons both weigh approximately one unified mass unit. If you're old like me, you keep wanting to call that atomic mass unit, but it's unified mass unit now. So symbolized by this little lowercase u here. And so the mass here, if we take it out to multiple decimals, here is 4.00151 unified mass units. And again, uh, we'll find out that the neutron and the proton both have masses of approximately one unified mass unit. And so that's why that mass number is kind of the nearest whole number, if you will, of the mass. Uh, and then finally, with those two protons, you might recall that electrons, we got the fundamental charge from them of 1.6 times 10 to the minus negative 19 coulombs, and that's a negative charge for electrons, but the proton has exactly the same magnitude of positive charge. And so if our alpha particle has got two protons and then two neutrons, and neutrons are neutral, no charge, and hence the name neutron, but if it's got two protons, then it should have two times the fundamental unit of charge, two times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs of charge total. Moving on to the neutron, it's got a mass number of one, an atomic number of zero here, corresponding to the fact that it has no overall charge and no protons associated with it. So, but a mass number of one, again, corresponding technically to the nice rounded, uh, to the nearest whole number of 1.00866 unified mass units, and once again, no overall charge. Moving on to the proton, just slightly lighter than the neutron here with 1.00728 unified mass uh, units. Uh, mass number is one, again, rounding to the nearest whole number. So, but the atomic number is also one. It's got a plus one charge because it is the proton. It has one proton because it is a proton. So, and then finally, it has, again, the charge of positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Positive, the fundamental unit of charge. Electron, we've probably seen somewhere along the way. So, and in this case, the negative one here doesn't mean it has negative one protons. Here's a case where it actually just simply means the charge. 
So charge is negative one, so the mass number is zero though. Notice it doesn't actually have zero overall mass, but if you round the 0 0.00015 unified mass units to the nearest whole number, it does indeed round down to zero. But important to note, it's not actually zero uh, for the mass. So, and again, negative 1.6 times 7 minus 19 coulombs. We'll move on to the positron, and this one is very likely to be new here at this case, if you haven't had a full year of, say, general chemistry, that is. And the positron is effectively a positively charged electron. It is the antiparticle of the classic electron, so it looks like electron, smells like an electron. The one key difference is it's positively charged instead of negatively charged. So it still has a uh, unified, uh, or it still has a mass of 0.0015 unified mass units, but again, the charge is now positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs instead of negative. All right, and finally, we'll talk about the gamma ray. And I said we're gonna be talking about a bunch of nuclear particles, and this is the exception. This is not a particle. This is actually super high energy electromagnetic radiation, super high energy light if you will, way outside the visible region of the spectrum, but the highest energy light, if you recall, we have like gamma rays of the highest energy and then X-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwaves, radio waves. It's top dog here, these gamma rays. So, and because they are actual light, they actually do have a zero rest mass. And so we've gone from the heaviest and gone down to the lightest. So, and you might think of it going from the biggest to the smallest. So we did, we kind of arranged it in this order for a reason. It's what we call the uh, penetrating power. The smaller your nuclear radiation might be, so if you're bombarding something with it, the more penetrating it might be. So for example, if we had a piece of, let's say, lead foil. So alpha particles aren't going to make it through that lead foil by and large. So, but the gamma rays would likely go right through that lead foil. In fact, you'd have to get a piece of lead several inches or maybe even a couple of feet thick to block out most of the gamma rays. So the smaller they are, the more they can kind of penetrate into a material. We like to use something very dense and heavy like lead. So for, for kind of shielding from nuclear radiation and stuff like that. So, but again, if, you, if you're likely gonna be exposed to something with uh, gamma rays, you're gonna wanna use much thicker lead than say if you're worried about exposure to say alpha particles. Uh, one other thing I forgot to mention here. So with electrons and positrons, you might also see them written one other way. We'll find out they're also called beta particles. And so you might see beta listed there for electrons or positrons as well. It's just the, the distinction again in the charge, just like we saw with E for electron there. So now let's move on to talking about the nuclear binding energy. In the context of nuclear physics, you might see it simply referred to as just the binding energy. So, but I'll probably make a point of calling it the nuclear binding energy. Now, properly defined is the energy it takes to break a nucleus apart into its constituent nucleon. So if you took all the protons and neutrons in the nucleus and were able to split them back up into separate nuclear particles, however much energy that would take, that's the nuclear binding energy. Now you gotta ask yourself a question before we move on any further. So why are all those protons hanging out together in the nucleus? Now the neutrons I don't have a problem with, they're neutral, they have no charge. But all those protons have a positive charge. Therefore, they should be experiencing some sort of electrostatic repulsion. They shouldn't want to hang out together in the nucleus. Well, we can conclude the only reason they're hanging out together in the nucleus is there must be some stronger force of attraction than the electrostatic repulsion they're also experiencing. So, and it turns out it's true, and they didn't get fancy on naming this new stronger force they discovered. They just called it the strong force or the strong nuclear force. So no, no fancy uh, naming system here. The strong nuclear force, it turns out, only operates at very, very short distances, uh, on par with like the size of the nucleus. If you get much further beyond that, it effectively goes down to zero. And that's why at larger distances, the electrostatic repulsions would dominate, but at these very short distances, this strong nuclear force is what's actually gonna dominate the interactions. Now, it turns out, though, that those repulsions aren't insignificant, they're still there. So, and it turns out they can play a role in the stability of the nucleus. So the, the greater the degree to which that nucleus is held together, the less likely it's to be radioactive. The more it kind of wants to split apart because it's not held so tightly together, the more likely it's going to be radioactive. So that's kind of how this works. And that's kind of, the, the nuclear binding energy can be a measure of radioactivity. The greater this nuclear binding energy, the less likely something's to be radioactive. The lower the nuclear binding energy, the more likely a nucleus is gonna be radioactive. 
Now, if you look then, so these protons uh, repel each other electrostatically, and that does play a role. It's not completely insignificant. And that's what the neutrons kind of serve the purpose for. So the neutrons and the protons are both gonna experience the same strong nuclear force based upon the surface area of these protons and neutrons. And that's why you wanna start adding neutrons into the mix, because you're gonna get more and more strong nuclear force without adding any additional electrostatic repulsion. So when it turns out, we can kind of make a plot, which we call the belt of stability. And it kind of shows you that all the stable nuclei that we're aware of follow on, along a narrow region when you plot N versus Z, where N represents the number of neutrons in the nucleus, Z represents the atomic number or the number of protons in the nucleus. And what you find is that for the very lightest elements, so the most stable nuclei have almost exactly a one-to-one -one ratio so of neutrons to protons. But then you see, once you, the elements start getting heavier and heavier, they start to deviate from this one-to-one -one ratio. And you find you're gonna start needing a slight excess of neutrons uh, to kind of, again, mitigate the repulsion experienced by all those protons, if you will. Uh, and this is gonna kind of reach a maximum of somewhere right around 1.6 to one. 1 1.6 neutrons for every one proton. Now it turns out if you get all the way to atomic number 83, you've hit a special limit. So it turns out for all the nucleides that are atomic number 84 and higher, so 83 was that limit, for 84 and higher, they are all radioactive. They all will experience some sort of radioactive decay, which we'll start talking about in the next lesson. Uh, and again, some are gonna decay very quickly. Some, it might take millions or even billions of years, but they are all radioactive from atomic number 84 and higher, all elements in that range. So next, I wanna take a quick peek at the element with the highest nuclear binding energy per nucleon. It turns out that's iron 56, so with a mass number of 56. So the atomic number of iron, if you look it up on the periodic table, is 26. And so we could quickly identify how many protons and neutrons. So how many protons for iron 56? And again, that matches up with the atomic number, so 26 protons. And how many neutrons would just be subtract the atomic number from the mass number, and we could see that there are gonna be 30 neutrons. So and if you kind of figured out where that is on that plot, it's actually kind of right in the middle of here, right here. So it's not quite amongst the lightest of the elements, but it's not up here with the heaviest, of, uh, the heaviest, the heaviest of the elements on this belt of stability. So and keep in mind, all the ones that are on here kind of peak out at an atomic number of 83. All the ones from 84 and higher don't make it on here because they're all radioactive. These are the ones that we have that are stable. All right, so iron 56 has what we call the highest nuclear binding energy per nucleon. If you look, it has 56 total protons and neutrons, 56 total nucleons, we say. So, and the amount of energy per of those 56 nucleons is the highest for any of the nuclides we know of. And therefore it is the most stable and least likely to be radioactive of all the different nuclides. Now it turns out as you kind of get mass numbers approaching 56, that nuclear binding energy per nucleon goes up, but once you get on the other side of 56 and they go heavier, it starts going back down. And so from both sides of mass, approaching 56 from the shorter, or the lighter side and the heavier side, both approach, uh, approaches that maximum right at that mass number of 56. So, and that's gonna have implications for the fact that, you know, the lighter nuclei are much more likely to undergo nuclear fusion, fusing nuclei together to get heavier and closer to 56, whereas the heavier elements are much more likely to undergo nuclear fission and split apart into lighter nuclei, lighter nuclei that might be closer to 56 as well. All right, so again, iron 56, the nucleus has got 30 neutrons, 26 protons, and we know exactly to five decimals, and even more technically, uh, how much a neutron and a proton weighs. And so we should be able to take 30 times 1.00866 unified mass units and 26 times 1.00728 unified mass units, add them together and get the mass of the iron nucleus, or at least so we should think. But you never do. It turns out the nucleus is always going to weigh less than the total sum of the constituent nucleons, always. And it turns out that some of the mass of the protons and neutrons is converted into energy, and it's that energy that's holding the nucleus together. That's the nuclear binding energy. So, and the nuclear binding energy is effectively the potential energy associated with that strong nuclear force. Now, if you think of gravity, gravity is a force, but we also talk about gravitational potential energy. It's the potential energy associated with gravity being a force. Same thing here, this nuclear binary energy is the potential energy associated with that strong nuclear force. And again, it peaks out at iron 56. Now, if you took and added up the weight of 30 neutrons and 26 protons, 
and then looked at how different that is from the actual mass of the iron 56 nucleus, that difference would be the mass defect. And then you could take that difference and then use Einstein's formula, kind of a uh, resting energy conversion here, and you can figure out how much energy has that mass been converted into, and that's how we actually figure out the total nuclear binding energy. And then you can divide it by 56 to turn it into to turn it into the nuclear binding energy per nucleon. And that's effectively it for this chapter. So you're probably uh, not gonna be calculating nuclear binding energy, I can't guarantee it, but it's not the most likely of questions. But if you did have to calculate, uh, calculate it, the most likely thing you would do is simply find the mass of, say in this case, 30 neutrons and 26 protons. They'd have to supply you with the actual mass of the iron 56 nucleus, and you would just take the difference and then plug it back into this formula. And again, sometimes they want that total nuclear binding energy, sometimes they want it per nucleon, and you'd have to divide by the overall mass number because that's the same as the total number of nucleons. So it really depends. But again, it's much more likely in a general chemistry course than it is kind of in a general physics course. So not the most likely of calculations and not really a whole lot of likely calculations for this section. But that will change in the next section when we talk about the kinetics of radioactive decay. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.